So I've got my, uh, my sequence 1.1 code here where I defined some print macros. And now I'd like to go on and do a little better job of keeping track of time. So first I'll save this away as S1.2. And I'd like to make sure that I actually see what I'm working with. So if I want to keep track of which sketch I'm running, I should probably print the name of the sketch up here somewhere. So I'll call this Rick's S1.2, just so I know where I am. I'm also going to print out a header for my values so that I know what each of them are when it starts printing them out. So I'm printing time in microseconds, pin 10 and A0, so that'll help me keep track of what's going on. So if I run that, I should see the output first with the uh, name of the program and then the title for each of the columns, so I know what's coming out. And it's coming out slowly because I've got this delay of 500 uh, milliseconds down here. I never want to use this delay function except to slow things down enough so that I can see them when I'm debugging. So what's next? I'd like to know what time it is. So I can use the micros function to figure out what time it is like that each time I go through the loop. So let's put uh, time now equal to micros. So at the top of the loop every time I'm going to find out what the time is and then I'll have that value for all the way through the loop. I won't need to call micros again and if I compile that oh time now was not declared in this scope. Need to make sure I declare the variable so it's visible within the loop and if I'd like to know what time it is now I'm going to get a micros value that's going to be a number between 0 and 4 billion ish so it needs to be an unsigned long, unsigned because it goes from zero up to a large value, long so that it will go up to a large enough value to keep track of the microseconds without just rolling over very quickly. Let's try that now. It uh, compiles, so that's good. And if we've got time now working, then instead of calling micros again, I could just put time now in here. And that should print out OK. Now, often I'd like to know what time it is in seconds, because if I look at these numbers here, 150, I'm not sure, that, oh, 16 seconds. But it's difficult to figure out when these are numbers in the millions, just where to put the decimal point. So I could create a floating point version of the time now and put it in seconds and that would be just equal to the time now divided by a million. So if I printed the time now in seconds that should make this code a lot more readable. And I'll have to put up here that that's going to be time in seconds. So I'll run that now and see what happens. Time now divided by a million. Hang on. Why is it always giving me zeros in the decimal places here? Time now is an unsigned integer value. And a million here is an unsigned integer value. So it's doing integer division. So any number less than a million divided by a million will be zero. Any number between one million and two million will be one, and so on. So if we wanted to actually do the floating point calculation, I've got to make sure that that constant is a floating point constant. So that should run, and that should give us times that are actually printing out with decimal places in them. OK, yeah, so we're getting half a second each time, and. And because we're not going exactly half a second in between steps, it's building up to a little bit more than 
on the half second. So that's making sense. And if I wanted to have some more decimal places displaying for the time, I could make it display to three decimal places. And that'll usually be enough. So I can now get it to display time to three decimal places. And I'd like to know not only what time is it now, but how long has it been since I last went through the loop? Now if I just knew the, what the time was the previous go through the loop, then I could subtract the two and tell how long it's been since I last went through the loop. And we often want to know how long it's been so that we can calculate a time derivative, for instance, from the change in time. So I could have a float value of dt in seconds equal to time now minus in seconds minus time last. Well, let's start let's start by doing it in microseconds. Let's get right to the basics. I'll have another unsigned long. It'll be dt and it's not going to be in seconds, it's just going to be in microseconds. And it'll be equal to time now minus time last. The time last time I went through the loop. Oh, but hang on, I don't know what time last is yet. Well, let's go to the end of the loop and have time last equal to time now. So the very last thing I'm going to do every time I go through the loop is initialize this time last variable with time now. So if I run that, oh, time last is still not declared. I would need to make it another unsigned long down here. But it wasn't declared in this scope. Why is it not finding it? I think I would have had to declare it further up here. So let's declare time last there. And I don't know what it's going to be equal to eventually, but to start off with, it's uh, we'll, we'll just leave it uninitialized and see what happens. So maybe now it'll work. So not to worry if you keep getting these errors as you go through. That's part of figuring out what you want to have happen. So it compiled this time. And so it's calculating dt. I need to know what dt is if I want to print it out. So that's okay. So time now, and then I could print dt. I'll print with a comma and a space uh, dt and see what it says. And let's see what comes out. I'm getting a number that just keeps increasing, but it should be a number like 5,000, the time in between steps. So it's not giving me what I want. Well, let's see what we can figure out. I'm setting time last equal to time now, and time now minus time last should be half a second. So let's print out time last. With another comma and a space. Let's see what happens. Time last is zero every time. It's not remembering time last 
that I set to time now. And that's because this unsigned long variable, time last, that's defined inside the loop is created brand new every time this loop is called. So it doesn't remember the value from one call to the next. If I wanted it to remember the value, I'd have to make it a global variable or make it a static variable. So I'll cut that out of there and put it out here. And now it's going to be a global variable. It should be visible everywhere and it should remember the value. So let's try that. Okay, so now the value is going up, but this value of dt is staying pretty close to the same. It's about 500,000 microseconds, and it varies a little bit. It's a little more than 500,000 microseconds, but it's about the right time between steps through. So I've got dt figured out. So what's next? I think that's working for me. I've got it so I know what time it is each time through and I managed to track down the difficulties I was having by printing out all of the values and trying to figure out why they came out the way they did and that allowed me to fix some things. So now I'm going to show you a couple of other tricks. One is if I press Command T or Control T on a Windows machine, then it will realign all of the uh, all of the lines to match the appropriate indentation level. So the only thing that happened here is that this unsigned long time last moved over right to the edge here. So we can tell it's right out outside any of the loops because it's flush right over here to the to the left hand side. But if I had been really sloppy. And for instance, I had wound up with that stuff that's inside the loop, not having the tabs on it that it should have to make it readable. If I press Command T, it does the tabbing automatically. And that makes it a lot easier to read the code and figure out what's inside one of these functions and what's outside one of the functions. Another thing I can do is if I didn't want to keep on printing out all of this stuff, some of the stuff that I put in there for debug, I could get rid of it. So if I wanted to uh, not print out those ones, I could highlight those lines and press Command or Control Slash, and it'll comment them all out. So when I run that, it'll only print out uh, the time now and the analog read value. So that gives me a couple of powerful tools for keeping track of my code, and for commenting in and out the stuff that's printing my debug values uh, just at the touch of a button. So now that I've got it commented out, if I highlighted two of those, I could command slash or control slash again and uncomment them. And I'll leave the digital read commented out. So there are a number of little tricks that you can use, but I want you to remember control T to get your formatting right, and control slash to comment or uncomment code quickly so that you can put all of that, uh, that printing in to do the debugging so that you can track down when you have problems in your code. And next we'll go on, now that we can keep track of time, we'll tidy up a little further to put some of this stuff out of the way.